Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Room for Discussion interview. Today, we are especially excited to have you because it's our very first Lustrum interview, celebrating our 15-year anniversary. In 2024, two billion people will be taking to the polls to cast their votes in the EU, the US, India, Indonesia, and many other places around the world. We don't have to explain the role that social media will play in these elections to you. But it's no wonder that a tech company just like Meta Platforms, the company behind Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Oculus, and soon also the Metaverse, is in the spotlight this year. Will these elections fare well? Or will we once again see floods of fake news amplified by deep fakes and artificial intelligence? Um, our guest today has had a long career in politics from being an MEP at the EU to being the UK Deputy Prime Minister from 2010 to 2015. Then he changed tax, and in 2018, he made the voyage across the Atlantic to join Meta um, as Vice President of Global Affairs and Communication. In 2022, he became President of Global Affairs, putting him in charge of Meta's global policy. It's fair to say that he could give us an insight or two about the future of tech and Europe. But before we welcome him onto the stage, we would first like to invite our real selves, maybe applause. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to our interview. What you just saw was a deep fake. So Surprise. what you saw was that the <laughs> lips and the voice that you heard were completely artificially generated. And while it might not be the best deep fake, I think it took us 30 minutes to put together. So it's definitely a glimpse into the content of the future. We tried to make a deep fake of today's guest, but that didn't make for a great interview. So rather he's here in the flesh. Can we have a big applause for Nick Clegg? Yeah. So. So great. Um, good afternoon, <laughs> Nick. <laughs> I'm uh, disappearing into this crowd. Yeah, it's a bit, you know, yeah. comfortable. Yes, I think right. we like to use. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here today. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, but we thought it could be nice to have the audience get to know you a little bit better first. Um, so we thought we would ask um, when other people ask you what you do for a living, what do you usually tell them? Uh, that I work for a big American tech company called Meta, uh, that I'm, as you said, I'm president of global affairs, and uh, is this too loud, or are you okay? You, you okay? Um, and um, so what I do in the companies, I oversee, as you said, I oversee the company's policies. What does policies mean? Policies, well, it means lots of things, but the main thing it means is this very fraught issue about trying to draw the lines as a private company um, often in the absence of any law that can guide us about what is and what is not allowed on, to be circulated on, on, our, on our apps um, and how we deal with elections, misinformation, hate speech and all that kind of stuff and how we interact with governments and emerging regulation. I also oversee the, um, the, the way that the company uh, communicates around the world um, and I'm sort of part of a small group of people who um, you know, support Mark Zuckerberg in running the company as a whole, yeah. Okay, very nice. Um, and before you started this job, you were party leader of the Liberal Democrats in the UK. Um, we imagine that going from British politics to American corporate life is a big change, uh, but also perhaps that being on the spot, so to say, on the floor of the British Parliament actually helped prepare you quite well for your current job. Would you also say that's the case, or...? Yeah, I mean, they're completely different places. I mean, um, I mean, Westminster and the House of Commons is sort of drowning in the past. I mean, if anyone hasn't visited, you just go there. It's just sort of, just like, it's the past. It's history, it just envelops you, um, which has good sides. I think it, certainly in the latter stages of my time in British politics um, and the run-up to the Brexit referendum, the, the country as a whole just almost was having an argument with itself about its own past. Mm. Because in many respects, you know, Brexit was a kind of 
triumph of sort of nostalgia over, over optimism about the future. And then you move to the, to the West Coast in the US and they're not arguing with each other about the past, they're constantly competing to lay claim to the future. Mm. And so it's been a very big change coming from, um, it's not just the UK, I think Europe generally, I mean, it's, it's, it's perfectly, it's perhaps understandable, but I think as a continent, we've somewhat sort of fallen out of love with the future, if I can put it like that. Yeah. Um, whereas, and there's plenty of good and complex reasons perhaps for that, but the, the thing about the California in particular, I'm sure many of you have visited it, uh, if not, it's a great place to visit. Um, it kind of looks as if it was put together last Tuesday. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, just, you just, it just feels as if it's just recently sort of been built, if you like. And um, instead of looking across the Atlantic, as we do here, you look across the Pacific. So everyone, huge focus on China. And, and, um, and it's sort of oddly, it's odd actually being in a place which, in a sense, going from Westminster where you just, I felt at least, somewhat weighed down by the emphasis on the past, you go to California and you feel there is no past. Mm. It just, just doesn't, it's just not there. And so it's a, very, it's a very different ethos. But you're right, in terms, of, in terms of navigating controversy, yeah, of course, both, both politics and government especially, but also these big tech companies, you, because you're constantly dealing with equities and values which compete and for which there isn't a... You know, one person's hate speech is another person's right to free expression. So you you know you have these you you have these ancient debates um, between privacy and security, and mm. you know liberty and safety, and so on and so forth, uh, which are play out, of course, now at vast volume on these big social media platforms. So to that extent, yes, it felt relatively familiar. And what mindset do you say, would you say that you're more in now? More of the future mindset, or more of the um, well, I've been there for uh, over five years, so yeah, uh, maybe I've sort of drunk the Kool Aid enough now. I, I, I think um, uh, I, I mean I, f I feel very European. Always will do. I uh, mean, you know, my mum's Dutch, um, my wife is Spanish. Uh, I was brought up actually bilingually speaking Dutch. I still speak Dutch to my mum. I was a member of the European Parliament for years. I worked for the European, all that kind of stuff. So, so I, I, and for me, it's just obvious, just obvious, just if you stand back that a a cluttered ancient continent as of ours, you know, composed of lots of small or medium-sized companies uh, bumping up against each other. And given the the history this continent has got of bloodshed and war and division, it just seems to be so obvious. If we want to compete in the modern world, we need to create the sum of our parts because mm -hmm. it makes us safer, but it also makes us more prosperous. Particularly against, particularly if you look at just the sheer scale of the the, uh, the China and the U.S. So, I, I kind of. I kind of think it's, of course, it's important not to be dismissive of one's history as a country or indeed mm -hmm. as an individual. But I think, um, I think a certain optimism and a hopefulness about the power of the future, sorry, is uh, is a pretty fundamental ingredient, it seems to me, for a, a kind of healthy, healthy uh, society and a healthy political debate. No. In the United Kingdom, you were also deputy prime minister. So, of course, that's also quite the change from the job you have now. But do you think that your new job is even more powerful than the last one? <laughs> no. I, I mean, people say, I, I mean, it's, well, there's a lot written about these big American companies. And some of the criticism and, and uh, skepticism is no doubt merited. Um, and uh, I certainly think if, you, if, you, if you're as big and simply as successful as these big companies are. I mean, Facebook is used by, well, it's, you know, the company's apps are used by around 4 billion people every month. You know, of course, I mean, I want to live in a society where people hold that amount of, that scale and power to account. So, so I think it's right that the company's kept on its toes and is subject to criticism and scrutiny. But I think along with that criticism and scrutiny, sometimes people overclaim how important the technology is um, I've learned over the last five years that there are two groups of people who overclaim sometimes the role of technology. It's the, it's the most ardent proponents of the technology who believe it can do anything and it's omniscient and can change everything for the better. And it's the, uh, it's the most vociferous critics who think it's the reason for everything that goes wrong in society and human, 
affairs and so on. It, 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 it's never, it, 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 they both overstate it. And I think they also overstate the power of these, you know, these technology, they can't, thankfully, <laughs> They can't, you know, they can't send soldiers into war or change your taxes or change what your child learns at school or how much money goes to your local hospital. Now, of course, I'm operating as the head of the kind of global uh, sort of perspective of the company at a global level. Um, but in the, in the sort of cake slice that I was dealing with when I was in politics, which was for five years I was the deputy prime minister of the country at a difficult time in the country, I think the, the granularity of the decisions you take that affect people's lives in government are far, far greater than, than even controversial decisions about how you rank or how your algorithm functions on a, social media, on a social media app. Important though that is, I'm not saying it's unimportant, I just don't think it's remotely as pervasive as a, as a form of influence in people's lives as is sometimes claimed compared to what governments do. Yeah. So for almost your entire career, and you mentioned this, you were an elected public servant, right? And now you work for a company that's, um, some would say, more powerful than many states. Um, you've been vocal many times about uh, not really wanting to trust Meta uh, to regulate itself in that way. It once should be publicly accountable, right? So was you taking this job? Was that a, a case of, uh, quote unquote, changing the system from the inside? Um, well, I think one of the reasons why, um, at that time, Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg reached out to me was um, that they recognized rightly that uh, for a company of that size, and it's not just Meta, it's, you know, I mean, it's all companies, but particularly these big platforms, whether it's, whether it's Google, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's Amazon, whether it's uh, Apple, and by the way, those com companies, I mean, Meta is big, but those companies are multiple times bigger. <laughs> Can you believe it than, than, than Meta? So in a land of giants, Meta is still, absurdly enough, actually relatively uh, small compared to those monsters. But um, that, that, that you can't expect society to um, grant a sort of, how can I put it, a, a permission or sort of license for those companies to operate unless they operate within the societal parameters and expectations. You know, however big these companies are, they, they should be serve, you know, they should be serving the interests of, I mean, the tech should be serving the interests of us, mm -hmm. society, humans, not, we shouldn't be, in a sense, serving their interests. But, you know, and, that, and that's, the, that's, the, I mean, that's the fundamental accusation. The fundamental accusation is that the way that these companies work and the business models they have and so on um, sort of uh, almost imposes a relationship of kind of data servitude on people. I, I don't believe that criticism it merits any scrutiny at all, but never mind, that's the thing. So of course you can only move forward if you, if you have guardrails, and, and the only people who are entitled to impose guardrails are elected, you know, elected politicians and governments, and that's why what you've seen, certainly in the half decade I've been there, a huge change, particularly here in Europe, but not only here in Europe, in terms of new regulation. You've got in, in the EU, you've got the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, I think this week the European Parliament is voting to adopt the new EU AI Act. Mm -hmm. so, so these companies, uh, it was always bound to happen. And, 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 and in the end, it, it, it's, I think it's healthy for everybody that these companies are, I mean, I can agree or disagree with them, and there are parts that I agree with and parts I disagree with. That's not really the point. It's, of course, it's right that you strike the right balance and mm -hmm. that companies operate in a way that is accountable to, to, you know, to, the, to, the, kind of, well, to the law of the land, of course. So guardrails are good, but also companies should do stuff internally. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So democracy has been an important topic along your whole career, but also still for Meta. So what we'll see this year is we'll have elections in the EU, the US, India, Indonesia, and in many more places, almost 2 billion people going to the polls in 2024. And this will also be the first time that we'll see generative AI involved in elections. Mm -hmm. So as Meta, are you ready for this election year? Well, I don't think one can tell, obviously, until, until the elections happen. I mean, it's worth, by the way, stressing that elections are happening already. I mean, Indonesia, which is the third largest democracy in the world, just had elections, what was it, two or three weeks ago. We had very consequential elections in Taiwan. We had very consequential elections in Pakistan. And, we have t and I have teams working to me who operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365, uh, 365 days a year, around the world, exactly making sure that the way that political content and political debate plays out on our bit of the 
ecosystem is done as you know is done within the remit of our own rules and so on, uh, whether it's on disinformation, misinformation, and so on. And to your point about generative AI, I mean, interestingly, so far, but I, honestly, this could change in a millisecond, but so far, I actually would say that the striking thing is how little generative AI has been used at scale. Of course, it's been used. You know, Imran Khan mm. used a generative AI tool to communicate with his supporters from prison in Pakistan, for instance, in the wake of the... Uh, election in Pakistan. So, of course, it's been used, but, uh, you know, we operate at a vast scale, and we have quite sophisticated systems which try and detect these patterns at scale. And so far, uh, we have not seen anything, we have not seen the use of Gen, Gen AI on a sort of system level um, manner in any of these elections. I mean, Taiwan is a good example, of course, for obvious reasons. There were lots of attempts at external interference in, in Taiwan. Um, using lots of different, and actually, in many ways, almost traditional methods of disinformation and so on. Actually, the interesting thing I think about Taiwan is, it, 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 um, because the Taiwanese population is so alive to that risk, they're surprisingly resilient to that kind of interference. Um, and I think it's, it, I know it's sometimes boring, and everyone thinks there must be some switch or some algorithm or some clever AI, AI thing that can make... Actually, one of the most important things to create democratic resilience is high levels of democratic sort of education about the online world, about how, of course, you should look at stuff with skepticism on the online world. And I think Taiwan was a great recent example of that. And it's kind of... I, some, I think it's something we need to kind of all emulate in the future because, of course, remember, generative AI... I mean, what you did there, yeah, it's kind of... but. Photoshop's been around for ages. I mean, there have been tools to, to fabricate um, visual imagery for a long time. But what generative AI, of course, it does it at a scale, at a speed, and at an ease. And, and yeah. you, you, I guess you didn't spe spend any money on that, right? No. no. Um, so, so in a sense, you're lowering the barriers for people to, do, to, to try and use these technologies to do things, which, of course, in some ways will be new. But I think, what's the, I think the newest thing is just that it'll allow for the velocity and scale of synthetic content, whether it's audio content, visual content, written content, and so on, to, to sort of take off. As I say, at the moment, right now, speaking here, you know, uh, 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 right now, and particularly looking at those elections so far since January the 1st, we haven't seen anything happen on a major scale, but we're doing a huge amount of work, both in terms of the engineering of our own systems, the policies that myself and others are developing, not just on our own, but with other companies. I work very closely with my counterparts in other companies because you, you, you can't, no one company can deal with this you, because, you know, stuff sloshes around the internet from one platform to the next. So you have to have common rules. So we're doing a lot of work at the moment, which I can bore you with in detail, but <laughs> in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is arrive at industry-wide standards where all the, at least all the big players to begin with have similar or at least interoperable standards of, of, of what's called provenance and detection, uh, so, that, so that when someone produces something which synthetically using a Gen AI tool, um, you know, let's say an image, that, that there's an invisible water. So let's say if, let's say if you produce an, a, 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 a synthetic image, right? Um, but you've produced it on a tool which is not owned by Meta. I don't know, it's Midjourney or Stability AI or one of the endless tools. And then you want to share that to all your friends and stuff on Instagram. What we're trying to arrive at as an industry is standards of invisible watermarking. So our systems would immediately detect as that content is ingested onto our platforms, because you're sharing it on the Instagram app, that it is synthetic. And that then allows us the opportunity, if we want to do that, to then put a, a watermark on it so that when someone sees it, they can immediately see that it is synthetic. Now, at the moment, if you use our tool, so we have a tool called Slash Imagine, which is a very versatile visual synthetic image creation tool. If you use our tools, you will see a circular watermark saying this is AI um, if you use our tools. The difficulty, as I said, is even if we do that perfectly, our problem is that we also distribute other people's content. So we need other people to abide by the same standards, and that's what I'm working very hard at the moment to try and deliver, and it's going to be difficult because there are going to be lots of people, sort of, you know, bad, bad, you know, bad people who want to do bad things to our elections who have no incentive to abide by those standards. So even if 
us and Microsoft and Google and the rest of it, we abide by those standards. We're always going to have this adversarial issue of, of bad actors incentivized to, to subvert those standards, which is why some of our most advanced research, research at the moment, and we have some very advanced research centers in, in Europe, is trying to develop um, provenance and detection capabilities which can, uh, which can detect whether something is synthetically produced regardless of whether there is an invisible watermark or not. Anyway, I, I could bore you endlessly, but it's, a really, it's just a really important point that in the end, what you need is just a lot of hard work and smart people and smart engineers to build these systems because otherwise it is going to be very difficult for us to have the transparency and the user information that we need to be able to distinguish between synthetic and non-synthetic content. And if I may just sorry, one other thing, because I think it's interesting. I, this is my personal view. This is personal me, Nick Clay. It's not a sort of meta corporate view. But I, I wonder whether in the next few years, given these synthetic tools are going to become so prevalent, and there's going to be just so much stuff online which is going to be either 100% synthetic or what's called hybrid, a sort of mixture of produced you know, by, under human supervision. But I wonder whether we, as a society, we might want to also think of doing the reverse of what I've just described, is developing technologies which authenticate and verify and watermark content because it's, hu because it's authentic and it's human. Mm. Um, and I think for news publishers and for many others, I actually think... My guess is actually lots of people will respond well to think, ah, okay, I know that that kite mark, that, that watermark, that assures me that this is what it says it is and is not, and is not being synthetically uh, altered or produced. So I, 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 I wonder whether we should lean into that as a society in the years to come. Yeah. You mentioned that, just to go back to the beginning of your answer, you mentioned that the use of these AIs, especially in regards to elections, hasn't really been popping up that much. Are you surprised by that? Would you think that this would uh, more be used? I'm actually not that surprised. I mean, look, um, my first thing you've got to remember is uh, just a sort of sense of perspective. Um, in terms of overall political and news content on Facebook now, it's less than 3% of the total content on Facebook. It's just, you know, you've got to, you've got to remember that uh, people use social... Well, all of you will use... I'm sure, I'm sure you'll have countless apps on your phone which you're using for different purposes, to communicate to people in different ways. You, you'll use these apps for different... You know, if you want to argue about politics, candidly, Instagram and Facebook are not great places to come because it's not actually why most people use use those apps. I often say they're largely used for, you know, for babies, barbecues, and bar mitzvahs. <laughs> it's, it's built for family and for friends and people. You know, it's, it's, it's used to delight and to inspire and to share. You know, um, whereas if you want to argue about politics, you're in a political obsessive, yeah, there are other apps that you can do that on X. You can yell at each other about politics. So, so I, you know, I don't know what other surfaces see. Um, but on our surfaces, and given, as I say, that political content, news, and so on. It's just such a small fraction now of, of what people use. And we, and we have no incentive as a company to, to try and sort of amplify or try think quite the reverse, because it's it, not actually why people like... I mean, people don't like being shouted at about politics on, on, on Facebook, Instagram. And um, so, so we used to, or the company used to... I mean, it's complicated, but used to sort of boost certain forms of political content. That's, com that's completely stop stopped now. Um, and I think we've, in recent years, become much, much better at enforcing very high levels of transparency on how political campaigns use political ads, uh, which is a particularly a US phenomenon, but you see it everywhere. So now, if you, know, if you, if you, if you pay money to run a political ad on, online on Instagram or Facebook, you have to say who you are, who you're targeting it at, how much you're spending. The ad then goes into an ads library for seven years. So anyone can scour it and research. Re if you use a synthetic Gen AI tool, you have to declare that. If you don't declare that, we would block your ads and so on. So I, we haven't seen it, for, but, I, but that I, can't, I cannot stress enough. I think sometimes people talk about social media and lump everything together. They're very different creatures. They're different creatures. They're used by different people in different places for different purposes. I can only speak for our, I mean, our, you know, we're very, obviously very large, but I can only speak for our 
real estate, if I could put it like that. And so far, it may change. Of course, it, in fact, it almost certainly will. But so far, it hasn't. And I have, I've, I've not been that surprised by it, actually. So um, I do think that it, it would be fair to say, though, that quite a lot of political debate happens on your platforms. You have Facebook in the lead up to the 2020 US elections, for example. I know when I scroll my Instagram, even though I'm mostly a, uh, I mostly consume food creation content, I get plenty of political content as well. Uh, you also recently launched Threads, which is uh, yeah. very, very similar to uh, X, uh, formerly Twitter. So I think in that sense, uh, Meta is definitely an arbiter of public debate. Um, it would be, despite the platform being best shaped for barbecues and babies and bar mitzvahs, I think that's not quite the case. Uh, and keeping this in mind, I was wondering how everyone should relate to just the issue of Meta's accountability as an arbiter of public debate. Well, yeah. Uh... I don't want to reiterate. I just think you do have to look at the, pers you know, the overall perspective. It just, it just isn't true. Uh, um, it just isn't true that huge amounts of content, as a proportion of the total, yeah. is, is, is consumed by politics. And, and you, I can't, of course, speak for your feed. Every feed is no, different. That's the, whole, that's the whole point of social media is that it is a personalized experience. Every single one of it's those of you who use these apps, every single one of your feeds will be different to your neighbors. Um, so I can't speak that, but in terms of the system level that I do see, it, it, it is actually a very small percentage. But of course, a small percentage of a very large number is still significant. Um, and of course, we have that uh, responsibility, which is why, um, we, why we spend the amount of money and employ the number of people we do to try and make sure that that is done as safely as possible. So we have, we, we have spent in the last uh, must be about five, six years, we have spent about 20 billion US dollars mm -hmm. on safety and integrity on the platforms, including you know, election and, and political debate. We have employ uh, close to 40,000 people doing that. Um, we work as a company with by far the world's largest network of, including here in the Netherlands, of independent fact checkers who are independent of Meta. We pay them, but they're independent of us. They can look at anything on our platform uh, and identify it as possible misinformation and they can apply their, they can apply their um, judgment on it and then they can either judge that something is partly false or missing context or false and so on. And then if it's, if it's judged to be false by an independent fact checker, we will significantly demote it. So it takes a long time to find it if you're just scrolling on your feed. And we also put a great interstitial uh, a filter on it so you have to click through it to see it. Um, um, uh, so, so, you know, there are, I mean, you know, 20 billion, um, um, 40,000 people, all of those, you know, that is a very considerable investment. And, of course, under new legislation, not least the EU Digital Services Act, we have to show our homework. So we have to go to the decision makers in Brussels and so say, this is the way we're preparing for these elections. This is what we do. This is what we, these are the policies we would put in place. This is the way we enforce them. This is the way, for instance, we give users a right to uh, appeal. If they, you know, so if they feel, if you feel that, I don't know, I'm being silly, but your, your, what is your favorite Swedish dish? Uh, oh, I'm not so much into ah. Swedish food. Let's say meatballs. Okay, meatballs. So you, let's say, post a picture of meatballs on uh, Instagram, and Instagram takes it down because it says, no, that's a symbol for a demonic cult. And you say, no, it's just my meatballs. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you, you can now go to something we've set up, um, which I helped set up when I arrived at the company, which is the first of its kind in the industry, which is an independent oversight board um, uh, made up of Nobel Prize winners, former scholars, uh, former uh, government leaders, scholars, jurists, and so on. And they will then look at you, the post of your meatballs and will say, Meta, what are you talking about? This is ridiculous. They're just meatballs. You must restore Ella's uh, uh, picture of, of those meatballs. And we will then do that. Um, and we now publish, along with our financial results every quarter, so every 12 weeks, all the data on the areas of content that we don't want on our platform, whether it's hate speech, bullying and harassment, whether it's um, IP fraud and, and you name it. And we, and, and we don't just judge our own homework. So you have uh, the accounting firm EY independently audits it. And so that every 12 weeks, if, if people want to scour the data, you can see how good or how bad we are at identifying that content before it's reported to us by you know, a human being. So 
we've built this paraphernalia of, of transparency tools and, and, and data and, and appeal courts, if I can put it like that, mm -hmm. precisely to do what you say, which is, which is to make sure that we're properly held to account. Yes, by existing law, where that exists. But remember, you know, for a long time, certainly when I arrived at the company, there were no, there were no laws. Mm -hmm. So you're in this peculiar position as a private company of having to come up with ethically and morally and politically incredibly difficult judgments about what you did and didn't allow. For con I mean, hate speech is a classic example. You, you know, it, it's not illegal. So, so people yell at us, quite understandably, to take stuff down that ha has not been made illegal. So you're, you're asking a private company to arrogate to itself a role, a very powerful role, of basically saying to someone, you, thou shalt not say that, even if the law doesn't say that. And, and that's why I think you'll find the companies, maybe they haven't moved fast enough, I'm sure that might be right, but I think that's why you'll find the companies just sometimes quite a little bit kind of perplexed about what they should do, because if they move too fast, then they'll be accused of censoring content. If they don't move fast enough, they'll be, you know, they'll, they'll be uh, uh, accused of not sort of making people feel safe enough. And in the US, much less so here in the Netherlands or in Europe, but in the US, it's now such a polarized debate. I mean, roughly half the country in the United States thinks a company like Meta censors people's political views, literally just is discriminating against people on the right. And the other half basically thinks that we don't censor enough. Yeah, of course, uh, the oversight board is a really good example of what normal users can do if they disagree with a uh, decision that you've made on a particular piece of content of them. But of course, there's a lot of your business that goes on on the side that users can see if you look about algorithms or the ranking that you use for content in your news feeds. And there, it's much less visible and much less appealable. Uh, so what can regular users do to voice their opinion about that side of your business? Well, you could turn it off. If you don't like the algorithm, just turn it off. There's a very simple control which says, I know, I just want to see it chronologically. You, you, or you can, you, can, you can basically reconfigure it. You can, you can choose particular topics. Uh, you, you can prioritize some topics. You can switch others off. You can switch certain advertisers off. Um, I, I think we have recently introduced a control where if you want to see more sort of sensitive content, you, you can, but there's a default setting that you know, the content will be, we will remove before you see it in your feed, sort of sensitive content, which might be controversial and so on, but you can switch that off. So there's a high level of, and also, I, but I mean, look, to be honest, yes, you can, we publish, for instance, I, again, I, th I think, um, I'm not sure if other companies have done it. We publish what are called system cards. System cards list the signals that are used in the ranking algorithm to decide if you don't turn the algorithm off, the, rank, the ranking of the content that you see on your Facebook feed. Because what, what those algorithms are principally trying to do is just deal with a very pragmatic issue, which is there's an infinite amount of content, content online, but there's only so long that you're standing in the bus scrolling on your Facebook or, or in the supermarket or, or waiting for your friend to arrive that you do. So what you see before other stuff is really kind of important. I will, you know, the algorithm will quite predictably make sure that I see pictures of my sister on her morning walk with her dog than I do for a, an ad for a shoe shop in Melbourne, Australia, because the former is relevant and the, la the latter is not. And the, and the Facebook algorithm uses three principal signals to, to, to do its job. Uh, and, they, and, they, and they involve your choices. It's not, it's not as if the algorithm is sort of just like some sort of scary spaceship kind of imposing something completely beyond your control. It's three main signals. One, who your friends are, by far the most important. So you choose to be your friends is probably the single biggest signal. The algorithm says, ah, that con this is why you see content from your friends almost more than anything else. Secondly, which groups you're part of. And then thirdly, what content you engage with, you share, you comment on, and so on. And those are, the, I mean, there's many others. There's time of day, what device you use, is it short form video that you particularly like rather than text, and a whole bunch of other things. But they are, and, and we're, quite tr we're quite transparent about that in terms of publishing these system cards. I'm not candidly sure how many users from our, you know, around the world really want to look through these system cards. They're, they're not the most thrilling thing to read, but they are there. But I think the most important thing is, you know, if you. Do, if you want to use social media and you just literally just want to see the posts as they come in, it's super easy to do that. And it's super easy to change the mix of what you, what you, 
what you see on your feed as well. And, and from the company's point of view, you know, I, I know there's lots of stuff written about, you know, the algorithms are burrowing into people's neural pathways and getting them addicted to stuff. It's the, to be honest, it's just a little bit more simple than that. It's like we want people to enjoy themselves, to have a, a positive, of course, have a positive time, and to see stuff that they find relevant and enriching. So, and, and I mean, I, you know, I often read, oh, it's all about just getting a dopamine hit. It's not. It's not. It's not actually the. You know, we we rely quite heavily, for instance, on surveys so that people in slow times, not while they are experiencing the, you know, the, 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 the scrolling, you know, what is it that you found relevant? What is it that you found useful? What is it you found interesting? So that we can feed that into our systems. Um, but, but your central sort of question, of course, I 100% I agree with you that the more people feel that they understand the system, then, of course, from my point of view, you know, the, the lack of understanding is a big problem because what happens is that into that gap of no or misunderstanding floods a whole bunch of assertions some of which might be right, but many of which just are sort of are kind of almost anthropomorphizing these algorithms as if they've got some sort of you know malign intelligence. They don't. They're, they're, they're machines, and they respond to signals that you put into them. And, and, and the users absolutely should have as much transparency over that as possible. I think good time to turn to the users now. So I think we have time for some audience questions now. So if you raise your hand, we can see... Uh... Yes, we have a, you were quick here, um, in the middle, yeah. Um, oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for being here. I wanted to ask you uh, about, for example, in the international sphere, because, okay, now we're talking about Europe, but for example, I read about uh, the Rohingya and v countries where English is not, of course, a main language. How do you deal with that? And do you think, despite AI, that you would need to hire more humans to filter content, for, for example, hate speech, against uh, the Rohingya minorities when they f fled the country. Apparently, Facebook was very uh, flooded with a lot of hateful content. So I'm curious how you think you might hire and educate people or maybe users themselves to kind of control out like that, that behavior getting out of control. Y yeah, so, so um, as has been very well, I mean, we, we um, commissioned a full human rights review of what happened uh, in Myanmar. Um, and identified um, that clearly the kind of checks and balances and the controls that you talk about and the linguistic capabilities were not properly in place at, at that time. Um, this is now going back, I think, sort of seven or eight years. Um, and I think huge change, I mean, huge changes have been made since then, not only in terms of employing people who have the relevant local expertise in terms of local idiomatic and cultural sensitivity. But, but here's the thing, to your point about whether it's human moderators or not. Um, the, the huge velocity of content, I mean, the huge quantity of content, I mean, it's billions and billions and billions of pieces of content flooding across our systems every day. Um, we could employ, I mean, as I said, I was talking earlier about 40,000, we could employ 40 million. It's still, you still have a fundamental mismatch between what a human being can do you know, in their day job, looking at content moderation and um, the amount of content that floods through our systems. So we try and preserve our human content moderators to look at the most difficult cases, the edge cases, the cases which require judgment or need or require some understanding of context and so on. What we have actually found is that the AI systems are some of the most powerful tools in triaging and identifying um, content that we don't want to see on our platform. So, so um, uh, hate, hate speech, for instance. Um, I, I talked earlier about these reports that are issued every three months. You'll see in that report now the prevalence of hate speech on Facebook. Prevalence, as in other words, the percentage, as a percentage of the total amount of content on Facebook, how much of that is hate speech, now stands at around, uh, around 0.01%. So that means for whatever, you know, every... 10,000 bits of content you're scrolling, you might find one bit of hate speech. I'd love to get it down to zero. I don't think that will ever happen. But here's the key thing. It has declined by well over 50% just over the last couple of years for one reason alone, which is that the AI classifiers have got better and better and better. Because you know what these AI, I mean, for those of you who, who you know, are AI scientists, you know that they're, they're like great combine harvesters. The more you feed them, the better they get, the more accurate they get, the more nimble they become. Um, and so 
I actually think, whilst it's quite right for people to identify, as, as we did in the beginning, the, 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 the dangers or the threats about synthetically generated content, it's, re it's really important to remember, actually gener generative AI is also the best tool against bad content. Um, and a lot of the early, experiment, early experiments we're doing at the moment in the company of using Gen AI to identify patterns of content or specific content that we don't want to see on our, content, on our, on our platform is really very, very... So it's a sword and shield, if I can put it like that. Um, and, I, and I certainly believe that the company is now in a way, way better place in terms of linguistic insight, local knowledge, both working with humans, but also training our AI classifiers um, for, for, for in Myanmar, for the Rohingya people, and others than it was, than it was in the past. Uh, let's have another audience question, please. Yes, uh, Max, right in front. There you go. Um, hi. Uh, just recently, uh, Human Rights Watch identified that uh, Facebook has been banning content relating to Palestine and from Palestine up to a thousand times more than content from Israel or related to Israel. Could you please elaborate on uh, the policy that Meta has on this? And why even yesterday, during the Palestine protest here, all the live streams were immediately banned? I don't know about the latter, I'm afraid. I need to, I need to look into that. But in, 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 I think I can address the assertion, which is made by many groups and observers, um, uh, that there is somehow bias or prejudice in the way that content moderation works in, uh, in the, as, as the Israel-Gaza conflict plays out. Um, uh, and we very strongly refute that. Um, we have a lot of data which we publish to try and demonstrate that. We run constant teams work to me, uh, hold weekly reviews on all the reports uh, and content disputes that we see uh, emanating from um, Israel and Gaza. We have, as I was alluding to in the previous uh, uh, reply, we have, AI, um, we have AI classifiers that operate both in Hebrew and in, in, in Arabic. We have, of course, human content moderators as well. Um, I don't believe there is any evidence that we're somehow trying to uh, impose some kind of biased or pick a side view in terms of our content moderation. But, but, uh, yeah, we 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 don't want our platforms to be used for people to foment hatred, incite violence. Uh, we are duty bound as well, legally bound as a U.S. company under U.S. law to prescribe content that relates to or is uh, expressing support for. Um, uh, organizations which are prescribed under anti-terrorist le legislation, uh, which Hamas is. Um, and we try and be, to my, earlier, to my earlier question, we try and be, earlier reply, we try and be as transparent about that as possible so that people can have a debate about the data uh, and the policies, not about you know, newspaper headlines or, 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 or reports which are often based on quite partial uh, research. But listen, does, does it mean we always get it right? No. Um, does it mean we should be constantly, you know, scrutinized? Of course. Um, does, does it mean that we should constantly conduct reviews about how, we're, how our systems are running? Yes. And, and look, I, I said earlier that, you know, the reason why a lot of people come to Facebook and Instagram is often for playful, innocent reasons and so on. I think one thing we've discovered is human language changes in war. And I'm not... You know, we didn't build social media apps for war. I mean, when people feel that they are, their ex, you know, their existence, that it's an ex existential threat for them, of course, human language mutates very quickly. You, 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 you say all sorts of things that you never would normally in peacetime or so on. So it, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to hide. It's a challenge to apply our, how can I put it, our peacetime rules to an environment where people are, you know, struggling and fighting for their existence. That is, that is I'm, not, I'm not pretending it's easy. All we can try and do is uh, try and do it as transparently as possible. But for your, for the, in terms of the events yesterday, and I don't know which live, are you talking about Facebook Live or are you talking about other live streams? Okay. Okay, I, I need to look into that. Okay, I'm sorry, I just didn't know that, so I need to look into that. Um, 
Thank you for that question. So I think uh, both these questions refer to two excellent examples when uh, social metas platforms contributed to um, the exacerbation or otherwise creation of a uh, quite bad situation. Uh, I think there's many examples hang like on, hang that. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Sorry, I've got it. I don't think anyone is claiming that Facebook caused October the 7th. Or no, no. I, I mean, you know. Apologies, that's certainly yeah. not what I meant. Yeah. Um, just that social media is, the platforms work in a way where also the discussions and stuff, they can uh, just exacerbate the tensions. I think that's uh, something that could be said. Uh, it's happened before. Um, I know that you said it was perplex. Uh, it could be perplexing for companies to strike a good balance here between content moderation and, and censorship. Yeah. Um, we know that there's a motto internally in the company, um, and feel free to correct me here, but move fast and break things. I think that's been decommissioned some time ago. But decommissioned, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, because with generative AI, of course, you have a new technology. Yeah. Um, in politics, uh, new technologies like this would be subject to the precautionary principle where you make sure that you properly evaluate harms before you can actually uh, allow them to uh, run free in society. Uh, and of course, with a private company, it's more difficult to apply such principles because you have to be all the time number one. You have to, you have to compete with the other tech giants, yep. as you mentioned. Um, so how do you relate to this balance uh, with this new technology yep. that's uh, going to change the political landscape, yeah. going to change the landscape on social media, uh, between caution uh, yeah. and com competition? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a very astute question, because I think looking back on it, what is striking is that social media or these apps, they erupted very quickly at vast scale, what, 15 plus years ago? And yet... The European legislation to govern content on social media has only just been enacted. So you've had this gap of over a decade and a half between the advent of the technology and the advent of the rules and the laws and the regulation. And I think that's very unhealthy. It's very unhealthy. I think, I think what, what, what we should all strive to do is develop... I mean, you're always going to get a time lag between technology and, and rule, because rulemaking takes longer than technology in any way. You need to have a sense of perspective as a, I was a lawmaker, a legislator myself for 20 years. It's always very risky if you try and legislate in, in haste. Mm -hmm. but, but so there's always going to be a bit of a time lag. But 15 years, a decade and a half between the kind of private sector technology and the public sector rulemaking, that seems incredibly, and in, and in the US, you don't even have federal privacy legislation. It doesn't exist. You don't have privacy legislation which applies to the whole of the United States. Mm -hmm. You've got a few states doing things. So I think everybody has a huge incentive. The companies have a huge incentive. And, I, and I'll come in a minute why I think we, I think why we have an incentive which might be a little bit different to what you might assume. Uh, but also clearly, societally, we do as well to try and have that debate about the technology to, to, at the same time as we talk about what the guardrail should be and what the parameters should be, and I, and I think there are some signs that that is happening. The, the, you know, the European Union has passed this EU AI Act. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a perfect piece of legislation. I think some of it might actually hamper European innovation, but you know, at least they're trying to get that onto the statute book quickly with very clear um, testing and transparency requirements so that models are not released before they're properly scrutinized if they're ab ab above a certain size. Um, I was at a uh, at a meeting last June or July with my um, counterparts from the other big tech companies in the White House, with President Biden and his team. They've issued something called the, an executive order. It's not private legislation, but that also has very prescriptive um, standards about, ex again, the kind of disclosures that companies like Meta and Google and Microsoft and OpenAI and all the rest of it should make once you start developing and training AI models above a certain size. And I base, I mean, look, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I speak for the whole of Silicon Valley. I'm sure there are people in Silicon Valley, ah, oh, these wretched governments, they don't know what they're talking about. I, my personal view is that is a healthy thing. It's a healthy thing, given how versatile and powerful this technology is, that we're, we're trying to put the guardrails in at the same time. But to my point, what might surprise you is, the reason why I think we have an incentive is, yeah, of course, cutthroat competition and all the rest of it, and, absolute, and you're quite right to say, left to their own devices, 
private sector comp you know, competitors will just compete. Mm -hmm. you know, um, but I think, I think the mood swing, I think the sort of pendulum swing has been so violent over the last 15 years for the previous iteration of technology, you know, where, where it went from sort of frothy techno-utopianism. You remember the time of the Arab Spring, you know? Oh, social media was going to make the sunshine and the traffic flow, and everyone's going to be nice to each other, and everyone's going to be, you know, democracies. Yeah. And then it swung completely the other way, and now nothing that happens that people don't like is not blamed on social media. Of course, the truth lies somewhere in between. But I don't think, for the company's point of view, it's great to be caught in those sort of violent mood swings from sort of excessive optimism to excessive pessimism. So my hope is, actually, it's one of the things I spend most of my time on these days, so I'm, I'm traveling around Europe at the moment, is to talk to regulators and lawmakers. They don't know how these systems work. They're not technologists. It's to say, look, here, we, as a technology company, we can provide you with our insights about what, what would work so that you can, as I say, you can have the technology and the guardrails developed more or less in parallel. So you would welcome more regulation as long as it's in consultation with the companies? Well, at the end of the day, we're not legislators, so we, we can't, I mean, people can let, I, look, my only point about, I mean, legis, you have good legislation, bad legislation, you have legislation that makes sense, you have legislation that doesn't make sense, whether it's on pensions, whether it's on the environment, whether it's on tech, it's kind of like, that's lawmaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I guess my view is twofold. Firstly, if you want to legislate on a technology which is moving fast, then you better well try and understand it. Mm. And, and I, I just think, you know, it, it, there's nothing worse than passing laws about a technology that basically doesn't exist, or, or it exists in the, because it's just a, a subject of a headline rather than, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is I think Europe has some very big questions to, I mean, we have a big question to ask ourselves as a continent. I mean, um, you know, just, Look at our standing compared to China and America. It's not great at the moment. You know, the 10 biggest companies in the world, not a single one is European. If you look at investment into AI between the US and Europe, it's 50 to 1. So for every dollar spent here, it's 50 in the US. If you look at where researchers are going, if you look where patents are being issued, if you look where innovations are, it's all, it's not happening here. And I, I, and I say this as a former... Yes, politician, a former deputy prime minister, former member of the European Parliament, former European Commission bureaucrat, as I was once, is I don't want my kids to grow up in a sort of museum continent where basically Europeans spend their time regulating other people's inventions. I also want us to invent our own stuff and also be innovators ourselves. And I, I worry if you compare, you know, when I first did an internship in, 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 in Brussels, oh, long time ago now, when it was the single market was the new thing and people were debating whether there should be a single currency, there was this real sense of fantastic energy and hope that we would create this big single market on the scale of the Americans, on the scale of the Chinese. And now you fast forward a few decades later and it's all about, people have forgotten mm -hmm. about building a big open space of innovation in Europe. If you're, an, if you're a Dutch tech entrepreneur living around the corner here, and you, you come up with a great new online idea. You can't, I'm afraid, um, have it available to customers in Lisbon or Helsinki or Luxembourg or, or Berlin the following day. There are still so many barriers. So we actually haven't done what we said we were going to do 30 years ago. And so we end up instead spending all our time investing political energy in regulating other people or other people's technology. Now, of course, that plays a role. But if we also want to grow and we also want to invent new stuff, then uh, and we don't just want to always you know, open these, this is a phone made by an American company. I open it, it's an app made by an American company. It's like driven by AI, you know, run by, you know, America. You know, if you want to, real sovereignty comes from innovation, not regulation. And I think that's a really important message that people need to internalize, in my view, particularly in the run-up to the European elections and a new generation of decision makers in Brussels after this summer. One example there, of course, is ASML, which is a Dutch chip maker yeah. company. And they've also been complaining that, that there's not been enough vision from Dutch regulators to promote innovation, which is inevitably driving them away if we continue in the current trajectory, even though their market position is very important for the Dutch position very. in the tech industry. So what do you think the difference is between European and American legislators that does recognize the drive for innovation there and less here? Oof, I mean, I mean, I ask myself this constantly. Um, I think part of it is kind of geography and history. We're an old, old continent. We, you know, we drenched ourselves in blood twice in the matter of a few decades. 
we we have long memories of 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 the kind of what's happening in our continent and we live it we're just tectonically located in a pretty tricky neighborhood you know russia to the north middle east to the east africa to the south and so on and so forth it, it, you know just life just looks completely different if you're a younger country in america where you just have canada and mexico you've got vast open spaces it it, it just You've got plentiful fuel. You've got a global reserve currency, so you can just keep printing money. I mean, I, you know, as, as someone who, who, who had a terrifically difficult time trying to balance the books when I was in government, and, and, and no, doubt, no doubt understandably being um, bl blamed for it, you know, I always marvel you go to America. I mean, they've, they've added a trillion dollars debt in 100 days. It's just, like, unimaginable. Because you can just keep printing the money because people keep buying dollars. We don't do. We don't have. We don't have any of those advantages. So I think there's all there's a bunch of macroeconomic, historical, contextual reasons why. But culturally, I don't see any reason why we can't be a little bit more, a little bit more kind of uplift. You know, optimistic and go-getting about the future. The future is what you make of it. It's not. You know, I, I think if you constantly worry that the future can only be a threat. And that's, that's what I think happens in a lot of the political debate around technology. You end up, because there's only so many hours in the day. I mean, politics is not like anything else. It's kind of, there's only so many hours in the day, and you just have to choose what you prioritize. And if all you prioritize is, I'm going to spend my waking hours clamping down on stuff that I think may in the future be a, a threat or a worry, then you're not doing the other side of the ledger, which is opening up the opportunities for young innovators, inventors, researchers, academics, entrepreneurs to really come up with new, new things. And I think that's where the balance has really just got a bit lopsided. I think as we get to the end of the interview, maybe it's good to ask what the future holds for Meta. So you've been around for 20 years now, and you've been on board for six of those. Uh, so Facebook was initially built with the goal to bring people closer together. So of course, you're reaching more and more towards the goal with a glowing adoption rate. But the question is, when will that goal have been achieved? <laughs> well, I suspect never in one sense. But um, I think the thing that you will see for a company like Meta, I mean, there are two big, big bets that Meta are making. And they're bets where I really, I don't think anyone, I mean, anyone who claims to you that they've got a crystal ball and they can tell you exactly how it's going to play out uh, it is a charlatan. No one really knows. And one of the bets is that we will, all of us here, all of you, I suspect, maybe some of you not, but I suspect all of you have got one of these, an Android or an iOS phone you know, in your pocket or something, and you spend your life swiping on, on a screen. And one of the bets is that, we will move, that this isn't the end of technology, that we will move from 2D screens and phones to basically communicating with each other by something we put on the bridge of our nose through immersive technology, which is what you see, this, this early technology, the... The, uh, the Apple, uh, what's it mm -hmm. called? The Apple Pro, the, yeah. the Quest 3. Uh, we have not, unfortunately, for sale in the Netherlands yet. But we've got some very smart, cool looking uh, Luxottica uh, uh, glasses, um, um, which where you can now sp you can speak to an AI, you can take photos, you can take films, you can listen to music, you can take telephone calls, and so on. Um, so that's, and that's what they call immersive tech. That's called roughly what they call the metaverse the idea that you don't stare at the internet. You, you are immersed in it. So instead of looking at someone on a flat screen on a Zoom call, you sit as an avatar or eventually as a hologram. We would sit around. I might be several thousand miles away, but you and I would we'd still think we're breathing the same air. Because and those, by the way, that doesn't, that's not science fiction. I, I hold my weekly meetings in the metaverse already, and it's extraordinary. I mean, I'm a legless avatar that looks suspiciously 20 years younger than I currently am. <laughs> that's the avatar I chose. Um, but but it, what's amazing is I... I, I it's amazing how much I feel I'm in the presence, I'm immersed. So that's one big bet. And then the other big bet is the one we've touched on, which is generative AI, which is this, you know, AI is not new. It's been around, it's been talked about since the 1950s. We've been deploying AI for years. We've got a, one of the world's most advanced AI research teams, which have been open sourcing, sharing for free research, over a thousand AI databases and models over the last uh, decade. And how those two things come together, the new computing platform, where you're, sort of in, where you're sort of immersed and the technology is much less clunky, and the role of generative AI, how those things combine and converge, I think is the sort of elixir of the future, which is quite difficult to predict, but could and should just make you know, technology just way 
easier, more effortless, more enjoyable, and more supportive mm -hmm. than it currently is. So um, the future of this technology sounds quite exciting. Uh, you've mentioned that um, throughout this interview that Meta is thinking a lot about the future. You think about how to deal with regulation. You're thinking about how to deal with this new technology uh, that will perhaps play an even larger role in people's lives than social media does now. So for our final question of this interview, uh, we also wanted to ask um, if you think that Meta should take more responsibility for its impact on society in the future, no matter what form that takes. Well, everybody does. It does, but, but you, I mean, as I said, uh, it's been a theme throughout, throughout our conversation. Um, we're not lawmakers, so we need, to, we need to work within the guardrails and the laws that are imposed uh, or passed by lawmakers. Um, those laws and those rules need to, need to enshrine the values and the ethical and other and cultural values that people want to see reflect in society. And should companies like Meta play? Of course they should. I mean, I mean we're, not, we're, not, we're not divorced from society. We're not, we're not a sort of agent of antagonism against society. Mm -hmm. We are part of it. And the fact that so many human beings use our apps to communicate with each other, of course, um, confers a particular responsibility. And it's one that I hope with the passage of time, we're discharging with ever, ever greater sort of credibility and skill. I think on that note, we can end today's interview and our very first Lustrum interview with that. Uh, we're back here tomorrow with an interview with Brian Klaas, who's an author at the Atlantic and Democracy Researcher from 1 to 2. And on Thursday, we'll have our second Lustrum interview with the CEO of KLM from 2 to 3. <laughs> so we hope to see you there. As always, you can watch our, YouTube, uh, sorry, our interviews on YouTube. Uh, and if you want to see yourself on this catch one day, we have our applica applications open right now. Uh, they're on our website, so apply if you want to join. Um, thank you so much, Nick, for being here, and thank you for spending this hour with us. Uh, can we please have a round of big applause? Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.